Lesson 19, The Father of Paleontology How easy it is to read the biographies of those who have gone before us and judge their lives. When we see their actions in black and white on the pages of our books, we can take the time to evaluate what they stood for and come up with an assumption of who they were. The truth is, it is never quite so simple as what is written down. Throughout this unit, we have learned about biases, opinions versus fact, and primary versus secondary sources. Every action has motivations and intentions, which are impossible to judge when the people are no longer alive. All we can do is use their stories to think about, ponder, and learn from, but we can do that from a place of grace and understanding. As we learn about a man who lived in a very different time than our own, remember to look at him fairly, consider the culture, the prevailing thoughts and ideas of the time, and what you think his motivations may have been. Also, be careful not to esteem the flashy accomplishments above the person. Like a judge, listen to the whole story without coming up with an opinion until the end and see what lessons you can learn from the lives of those who have gone on before us. Meet George's Cuvée. The year was 1769 before Charles Darwin or Mary Anning, and before the word dinosaur had ever been heard. Georges Cuvée was very, would be heralded the father of paleontologists, was born in Mont, Montbier, part, which is now a part of France. As a young child, he was particularly frail and ill, and his mother spent a lot of time with him indoors because he couldn't run and play like his peers. Taught to read when he was just four years old, he discovered an insatiable hunger for learning and reading and art, and became some of his, which became some of his famous pastimes. When he stumbled upon a book about natural history, he was struck by the combination of art, history, and science, and shifted his study to pursue, pursue it far, further. Cuvée stood out from the crowd, even as a young teen, and when the king's uncle, Duke Charles, heard of him, he offered to pay for Cuvée's tuition at the prestigious Caroline Academy in Stuttgart, Germany. Cuvée accepted and left home when he was just 15 years old. Though he did not speak German, he had an aptitude for learning and a quick memory. He not only won the school prize for speaking German, but found a passion for comparative anatomy and zoology. Graduating from the academy in 1788, he found himself in the midst of political unrest on the eve of the French Revolution. He was able to escape it by moving in with a noble family in Normandy as a private tutor where he was free to continue his scientific studies. His career took off and he held numerous positions over the next 40 years in politics, teaching, and administration, at one point even directing all the non-Catholic churches in France. He held many titles in his lifetime, time, tutoring, teacher, professor, secretary, scientist, counselor, vice president, chancellor, grand master, grand officer, and director. Widely known and recognized for his expertise and contributions, he was given the title of Baron and became a French nobility. Did you know that Cuvée's first name was not actually George's? He was christened as Jean, Jean, Leopold, Nicolas, Frédéric, Cuvée. However, the year he was born, his older brother George's died. His parents called him George's in his brother's honor, a particular practice during a time when many children didn't survive to adulthood. Scientific Contributions Cuvée was a Christian, and his worldview impacted the way he saw science. However, like many of the scientists we have learned about, we, he did not try to connect the biblical account of creation to the age of the earth. Sources aren't clear on exactly what he believed, Let's take a look at some of his main contributions to science. Number one, Cuvée was the first science, scientist to establish the concept of extinction. At the time, he, 
This was very countercultural, as many people believe that if God created the world and it was good, nothing would have died off. Cuvet, using his skills at comparative anatomy, was able to compare the bones of the African elephant, the Asian elephant, and the mammoths. He asked the question, where are the living mammoths? Number two, if animals did go extinct, the next question was how. Cuvet hypothesized that it happened through a series of catastrophic catastrophes, which included floods, volcanoes, and storms. He believed that things happened in a cycle, and that would have caused entire species to go extinct. Three, Cuvet did not believe in evolution. He saw too many evidence that showed that a whole organism was reliant on each individual part and that if anything changed, it would not survive the change nor its changed environment. For example, our bodies are created to have each system rely on the next. Without our skin to protect our organs, we would get infections and die. Without our nervous system, we would not be able to feel pain and avoid danger. If we were to lose one part of our anatomy, it would have drastic consequences on our lives. In the same way, he believed that everything was orchestrated to work together and that changes proposed in evolution would have been impossible. To help prove his theory, he studied mummified cats that were thousands of years old and compared them to the cats at the time. His study showed no anatomical changes. He also divided animals into four classes or branches, vertebra, arculate, mollusca, and radial. And he did not think that organisms could cross over or evolve from branch to branch. Four, Cuvet worked on the, at the Museum of Natural History and had the opportunity to study many different bones and fossils. He was the first to name the pterodactyl in 1809 and published his finding. He also described the, monosaur, the Mosasaurus and named other extinct animals, including the mastodon and a giant sloth called Megatherum. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's a flying reptile. Cuvet named a flying reptile the pterodactyl. But since his time, many more extinct flying creatures have been discovered. Because of this, pterosaur is now the family name for all the winged lizards, and various names have been given to the different species that were found over the years. While pterosaurus lived during the same time as the dinosaurs, they are not actually classified as dinosaurs, just like the... Plesiosaurus and the Ixosaurus, we learned that near the beginning of this unit, the first pedosaur was discovered by a French historian and scientist. While the pterodactyl that Culver identified had a wingspan of only about three feet or so, some pterosaurus were truly massive. The largest one that had been found at the time of the publication was discovered in Canada and was named Cragdocton Brorus, which means frozen dragon of the north winds, with a wingspan of more than 32 feet. It would have been about the size of a small passenger airplane. Can you imagine seeing a bird that size diving down for a tasty snack? So far, only partial skeletons have been found and pieces of bone that scientists uh, believe belong to the same species. There is still a lot of information to be uncovered about the new species and many more questions than answers. From what you have heard about Cuvet, do you think he is somewhat admirable? He remained a devout Christian for all his days. He opposed evolution and he stood against the mainstream beliefs to prove extinction. And yet, with all his titles and accomplishments, Cuvet, like all of us, fell short. During his time, he was known to participate in experiments on a South African woman known as Sarah Bartman. She had a uniquely shaped body and was documented to tour various freak shows, as they were known at the time. She became quite famous. After her death, her body was studied and even cast into a mold and put on display. Her story is highly controversial, and it is unclear whether she was coerced or participating 
on her own free will. Cuvet believed in what termed a racial science. He believed that they had originally been three species of the human race, Caucasian, Mongolian, and Ethiopian, and that the Caucasian race was intellectually, intellectually superior. Unfortunately, this view was not uncommon at the time. Even in early America, many Europeans believed themselves to be superior to people of color. In fact, it was only a short time later, during World War II, that the idea of scientific racism took on its most tragic form in the Nazi concept of superior race. Instead of putting Cuvet on a pedestal for the things he achieved, we can see his life through the lens of the culture at the time and our fallen human race. We can learn from both his strengths and his failings, and though through it all have a better understanding of the underlying beliefs and ideas that have woven their way through the history of mankind. Think about it. Have you ever put someone on a pedestal before? The higher we esteem people, the more likely it is that we will be disappointed. It is not wrong to admire someone, but we have to be careful not to idolize them. Talk about the difference between admiration and idolizing, and see if you can think about someone that you perhaps have an unhealthy view or expectations of, such as a, someone who is famous or highly respected. This concludes Lesson 19 for today.